You're tuned to 1520 WCAT Radio, and it's time now for the Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will offer reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today, and now Sam Hankin. Welcome, everyone, to another edition of the Avid Reader. Today, our guest is Kevin Birmingham, author of The Most Dangerous Book, The Battle for James Joyce Ulysses, which is his debut. It was published this June in time for Bloomsday by Penguin, uh, and it was also uh, published in time for the centenary, centenary of the publication of Dubliners. And, uh, Kevin, you still have your father's copy of the Dubliners. I do, yeah. It's uh, the really, until recently, the only copy of Dubliners that I had. And uh, if you look in the selected bibliography, I actually cite that version of Dubliners, uh, which is a small way of saying uh, hello to my father, because I think, in a way, books are uh, ways to connect people to people. And I couldn't agree more. And of course, I have an independent bookstore, so I obviously feel that way as well. Um, so I can't pronounce the. I've never been able to pronounce the publisher of the first editions of Dubliners. Um, is it Hoopsch? H U E B S C H? Yeah, Hoopsch. Okay. He ended up uh, uh, founding Viking. So uh, before it was called Viking, it was uh, it was the imprint was under his name. And we were talking about uh, how much. I love Joyce, and that's another one I have the first edition of by Hoipsch is, um, is Dubliners. And, uh, you know, it's, it's funny, I have a love-hate relationship with um, having first editions because, you know, once you read the book, you have the author's soul in your mind. It's, the question is, what's the intrinsic value of having a first edition? But that's neither here nor there. We're here to sell your book. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it's, you know, the, the first edition of Ulysses was, an especially rare find for people. So, you know, there were only a thousand books uh, published in that first printing of that first edition. It was a limited uh, edition and it was uh, circulated privately. So to have uh, one of those copies is to be, you know, one of less than a thousand people because I don't think all 1,000 survive. In fact, I know not all 1,000 survive. Some of the copies of the first edition were already beginning to be seized by uh, U.S. customs officials as they're being sent out from Paris into the United States. In addition to that, a lot of the people who did try to bring it over would rip the blue wrappers off, and, and mine still has the blue wrappers, which is the per it's the perfect sea green color that uh, Buck Mulligan is talking about when they're at the Martello Tower. It's the perfect color for the, the covers of the book. Yeah, and he wanted uh, Joyce uh, asked the printer to get the blue to match the blue of the Greek flag, and it was incredibly. Joyce was very demanding. Uh, yeah, uh, it was incredibly difficult for for him to match the exact color. He actually, the printer actually had to go to Germany uh, from France to get the color. I don't know exactly how they did it, um, but most of the, a lot of the copies that ended up making their way into the United States were bound in fake covers. Uh, some of them were bound as the Holy Bible, some were bound as the complete works of Shakespeare. Uh, one copy that I know of was bound as a biography of Ulysses S. Grant. So <laughs> all these were basically decoy covers to get Ulysses into the United States so that when a customs official was going through your belongings to making sure that you weren't taking any contraband into the United States, they would take a quick look at the book and uh, not realize that it's actually James Joyce's Ulysses, which, if they did realize it, would have been taken away immediately. Well, you know, um, we'll obviously, be, we'll, we'll be talking about obscenity a lot today with regard to the book, because that's essentially um, what this book pivots on. But one of the things I wanted to mention was it's such a perfect storm um, that brings uh, Bennett Cerf and Morris Ernst and Judge Wolseley and, and then Miss Barry, Miss Weaver, and Miss Beach, uh, Nora, yeah. and of course Nora Barnacle. And, right. and so it's like the Beatles. <laughs> tell a little bit about, I know we'll be going into the, the, the trial, the non-jury trial, but tell a little bit, which was fascinating, about how Judge um, uh, Wolseley ended up being the judge. So uh, Morris Ernst, who was one of the uh, co-founders of the ACLU was uh, very keen on getting Ulysses legalized because he thought it would expand uh, the freedom to publish literature in general. He had a lot of experience defending, uh, a, you know, quote unquote obscene books, and in his experience, uh, juries were horrible. That uh, it was 
always better to have a judge uh, issue a verdict on a book rather than a jury, because juries, as soon as they would sit down with a group uh, of 11 other people, they would suddenly become offended by books that they actually really weren't offended by, because it was this performance of purity. So he was looking for a judge to rule on it directly and uh, he wanted the government to waive the right to a jury trial to it, which the government actually did agree to do. And he wanted Judge Woolsey in particular because Woolsey was a uh, well-read man and he cared about literature. And he had actually ruled on a couple of cases, obscenity cases before, cases that were argued by Morris Ernst. Uh, one of them was a, um, a pamphlet, medical pamphlet called Contraception, by Dr. Marie Snopes, uh, by Marie Stopes, and so Woolsey knew that. Uh, so Ernst knew that Woolsey was a sympathetic person, and so they had to manipulate the uh, judicial calendar because there's a rotating uh, panel of judges on the uh, uh, on the federal district court, and so they waited effectively for months to get Judge Woolsey assigned to the case, and uh, when he was, then suddenly they realized they had uh, a, good, a good shot at getting it legalized. But if it wasn't for Judge Woolsey, if some other judge had, had considered it, there's a good chance that it would not have been legalized in 1933. I don't think it would ever have happened. It was, and like I said, it's just so many karmic wheels had to turn at exactly the right time for all of this to occur. Right. I mean, there, there was another judge that was supposed to be sitting the time uh, on the date where the hearing was going to be set, and that judge happened to get sick. Yeah. And so Woolsey was effectively taking another judge's place. And he read the book cover to cover. Uh, a lot of the details that I've gotten about Judge Woolsey, he's a character that's been you know, flying under the radar of history for a long time. But I managed to track down Judge Woolsey's grandson. And Judge Woolsey's grandson gave me all these private documents to, to look at. The library where Judge Woolsey read the book is still intact the way it was in 1933 when the judge read the book. And uh, so there are all these little details that, that make Judge Woolsey alive were, uh, are still in private hands, and so I was very lucky to, to get them. It was great when uh, <clears throat> Bennett Surf and Random House included, for various reasons, the decision in the book itself um, you know, because then if it was challenged again, the right. decision would be there and it would be established as a classic. But I, when I read that first, in many ways that was as elo eloquent and as valuable to me in terms of literature. Right. Yeah. It's really a, an amazing opinion because here you have a judge who is effectively engaging literary criticism, which is one of the only times a judge uh, is actually willing to do that and is effectively called upon to do that. But the literary criticism he issues about the book is really, uh, really on point and and is very sharp. Yeah, and what's so he, what, he, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say what's even more amazing that is when it went up on appeal before Learned Hand and his cousin, right. that they upheld it even though they really didn't like Wolseley's. They didn't. Yeah, it's it's one of the things that you know I discovered is that you know Learned Hand and, and Judge Wolsey didn't get along very well, and when Wolsey wrote his opinion. One of the unusual things about the opinion is it doesn't cite very much uh, hmm. uh, case law. Usually you sort of backstop an opinion with multiple other opinions that are similar. And he could have cited Learned Hand because Learned Hand had some important decisions related to obscenity, but he didn't. He sort of wrote the opinion with the hope that it would be read by people outside of the law. And now that uh, Random House had decided to print a copy of the decision along with every copy of Ulysses that they've ever published, it's potentially the uh, single most read uh, judicial decision in U.S. history. Yeah, no doubt. It's amazing that I think if Ulysses was held up to scrutiny now in many courts or in many states where evolution is not able to be taught, yeah. it would be now be found obscene. In fact, think about it, it's um, you know, almost a century now coming up. Um, I can't say the words that Molly Bloom says in her soliloquies. Right. I can't say them here on the air. Right, right. There are still, I mean, some people ask me, you know, what's the, what's the importance of this story for us today? And one of the answers to that is that obscenity is as illegal today as it was in 1922 when Ulysses was first published in Paris. The only difference between today and 1922 is 
in the way that we define obscenity. And that definition of obscenity can change at any time. All it takes is a few new cases by high courts that start to redefine what obscenity means. And part of what's so important about the Woolsey decision is that it was instrumental in changing both our understanding of what obscenity is, and I think even more crucially, and this is what people don't normally get, I think, Woolsey was changing our understanding of what art is. Uh, because for Woolsey, art was something powerful enough to transform what we normally think of as being dirty into something beautiful and useful. For Woolsey, it was uh, like a little piece of a mosaic uh, that could contribute to a larger picture that Joyce is painting about, uh, about everyday life in the 20th century. And that was actually very new. These days, if you think of that as a normal thing, think about. But it used to be that if you had something dirty, if you were saying a few dirty words, it didn't matter what the context was. It was dirty in and of itself, and therefore it could be banned. But Woolsey had transformed that way of thinking about the relationship between art and so-called filth. And what's really interesting, you have these, I guess you can't call them epigraphs, but you have these introductory quotes to the chapters. And in one of them, where um, you know Joyce is so dependent on Nora, um, yeah. when he talks about, you know, now my dar darling Nora, and he's, he even says that his book is ugly and obscene. He uses yeah. the word obscene. A and it's just funny because um, it's what happens is almost that the value of the book, well, it's true, what the value of the book trumps what is clearly actually obscene. I mean, what when, when people say now everything can be said, like Esber Pound or Hemingway saying, you know, there's no limits now. Right. Um, some of the things, you know, uh, that Molly says are uh, offensive to me. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're still disturbing. And you really can see, uh, you know, Nora Barnacle is, in Joyce's partner, is behind the story and in a way hovers over the story in more ways than one. And one of the ways in which she inspired Joyce and turned him into a writer, effectively, is uh, this these so-called dirty letters that they exchanged back and forth between each other in 1909 when Joyce had returned to Ireland for a few months and Nora Bonacle was still in Trieste. And in these letters, Joyce, you know, in 1909, Joyce was still uh, not published. He had, you know, Dubliners had not yet come out yet. In fact, he was struggling to find a publisher for Dubliners, and it wouldn't be, uh, as you've mentioned earlier, until 1914 until he would actually get a publisher. So he was at a crossroads, and he felt as if he was questioning whether or not he could actually be a writer at all. But in these letters, you can find himself really making himself vulnerable to Nora Barnacle by telling her everything he wanted to do to her and with her. And you can see this sort of, you know, for lack of a better word, an obscene imagination sort of taking shape in his mind and the willingness to actually put it down on paper for the first time for him. And it's this great unburdening, and you can see how Joyce is learning how to, to say everything to someone. And in a way, I think of Joyce thinking of all of his readers as uh, someone like Nora Barnacle, someone who is a lover from afar, who is going to be listening very carefully to every word you say. That's what he wanted. Nora was a model for, for every reader Joyce ever wanted. Yeah, and <clears throat> Joyce would have been satisfied with one reader spending his entire life, his or her right. life, especially with regard to Finnegan's Wake. But, um, yeah, what he wanted was he was a very vain man in terms of um, his literature and lots of other things, too, and a very demanding man. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, it's definitely true. And I think that, uh, you know, some of the characteristics that made Joyce an incredible writer made him a very difficult person to deal with. He had this strong conviction about the importance of his work. But what that meant is that everything and everyone else in his life took second place. Nora Barnacle was probably the, the one exception, and he would sort of uh, push her and be demanding with her until you know, she got upset, and then, of course, he would, he would apologize and uh, depended upon her uh, very much. But it, it was tough to deal with him because he was so convinced about the importance of his writing, and in a way he needed that conviction in order to get the writing done in the first place, spend hours upon hours. There's this one moment where Lucia Joyce, Joyce's daughter, is remembering Joyce after 
she died, and she's remembering him writing Ulysses in the middle of World War One. And the image that she calls up in her mind is of her father on the floor, and arrayed all around him are these notes and notebooks and manuscript pages, and they're all crossed out in in red and and blue and green crayon and so forth. And she's looking at him, and it's this image of him isolating himself, that he had sort of ensconced himself in this this novel, and the novel had become this world for him, and the family felt as if they were being pulled into it. And it, it must have been tough for her and, and, and tough for the family to see, to see Joyce uh, retreating the way he did. When you look at the Rosenberg edition of the, uh, the facsimile of the actual manuscript, the person I feel most sympathetic for is anybody who attempted to transcribe. <laughs> I'm, I, I can't even imagine. <laughs> the handwriting is, is incredibly bad. Uh, yeah, to, to read the manuscripts for all the letters, and you know, there are thousands of letters. Luckily, most of them have been transcribed by other scholars. So I didn't have to, to go through all of them. But I, there were, are several unpublished letters that you know, you're trying to read, and it, it really is tough to do. The only advantage, I should say, is that you do sort of get used to someone's handwriting after a while. After you've read about uh, eight or nine letters, it gets a little bit easier. But a lot of people had uh, had really difficult handwriting to deal with, including Joyce. Well, the funny thing is, it's like, you know, you could say, well, wait a minute, uh, Dubliners or, or a portrait of the artist could be like the Rosetta Stone, um, in which you could then interpret what had, you know, what the words were. But the problem is then, even worse, if you get to Finnegan's Wake, because a good percentage of the words are not words at all. Um, I don't yeah, even, I, don't I can, I've, he must have had troubles, uh, I mean, in some cases people were transcribing things for him by the time Finnegan's Wake was happening, but uh, people, he had typists refuse to do the work. Uh, I would. Because, they, you know, for Ulysses, he had uh, nine typists just for one episode, for the Circe episode. Uh, they had various problems. Some people just refused to do it. Some people got sick. Uh, and then one typist, her husband, at, looked at what she was typing and burned the <laughs> manuscript. So a portion of Ulysses uh, was burned in manuscript before it was even published uh, as a book. So uh, the problems began very early and extended long after uh, the Paris publication of Ulysses. It's interesting. In your introduction, you talk about there's so many biographies of Joyce and that this wouldn't be a biography. But from time to time, you were required um, by uh, your research to also include uh, things that were happening in Joyce, Joyce's life or his history in order to make the rest, of the, the rest of the book make sense. And maybe you could talk a little to our audience about these patrons that were all women, whether it's as I said, yeah. Miss Weaver or or Sylvia Beach, who was like my heroine, you know. Right. Yes, she's you know Sylvia Beach as you know a the paragon or the patron saint of uh, of independent booksellers worked uh, really hard uh, for Joyce, uh, as did Harriet Shaw Weaver, who effectively funded Ulysses. The reason why Joyce was able to quit teaching English and write full time is because Harriet Shaw Weaver was giving him money and. She's she's remarkable for being uh, very prim and proper, and she came from a devout uh, Church of England family in the UK. And uh, her family was taken aback by the fact that she was being a patron for this scandalous writer, this writer that people were uh, were calling a literary Bolshevist. They were calling him an anarchist. They were calling him insane. He was uh, uh, he was just the complete opposite of everyone that. Uh, of everything that Harriet uh, Weaver, or Miss Weaver, as everyone called her, uh, the opposite of what she seemed to be. And Sylvia Beach gave everything to Joyce, and Joyce acknowledged this uh, years later, that she effectively devoted the prime years of her life uh, to him and to his book. She opened up Shakespeare and Company in 1919, and she had to borrow money to, do, to, to, to get her stock, to decorate the place, um, and it was just tough to make ends meet. So tough, in fact, that she lived in one of the small rooms in the back of her bookshop. She was sleeping on a cot in the back of that bookshop, uh, right next to a metal grate where the she could hear the rats sort of crawling along the grate. And that was how she started off. She had she had very little money. 
Um, but she met Joyce in 1920, and she was captivated both by him as a person and as a writer. And when the censorship trouble started, because they started before uh, Joyce was even finished with the book, all of the publishers, including Hoops, who we were talking about earlier, all of the publishers fled. They wanted nothing to do with Ulysses after a portion of it was banned. Uh, Joyce came into Shakespeare and Company and sat down in his favorite chair. He had a favorite chair in Shakespeare and Company and complained about the fact that he couldn't find a publisher, that now no one wanted to publish his book. And finally, after listening to Joyce complaining, Sylvia Beach said to him, would you like me to publish your Ulysses? And Joyce said, I would. And so that was the, the small moment that took place in an independent bookshop that uh, changed both their lives and changed the history of modernism forever. And it's so funny that she was so put upon by him, and your book makes it, uh, it's an interesting, poignant point, that finally she says something, but she says it in such a uh, eloquent, polite way, you know, she says, you know, look, I've done all this for you, can you please like, kind of give me a break, you know? Yeah, it's as if he, uh, it's almost as if Joyce wanted to, to test people's limits for him, and I think he was doing that for, for Sylvia Beach. There was a part of Joyce that, uh, that almost wanted to be betrayed, I think, or to wanted people to turn uh, their backs on him. And that's, uh, I think, what was happening with Sylvia Beach uh, at the time. And finally, he had found Sylvia Beach's breaking point, and she just said, I can't do this anymore. You're asking for advances to printings of Ulysses that aren't even out yet. But it's hard for me just to make ends meet. And here I am running around trying to get uh, eye medication for you and helping your family out and uh, taking care of all your needs and getting books for you and so forth. And it was just, it was, at some point it just became uh, too much. But you can really see, you know, Sylvia Beach is uh, uh, one of the heroes. I don't, don't want to say unsung heroes because people already know about her, but it's hard to say enough good things about her. When Ernest Hemingway met her when he was young and in Paris, he called her uh, the nicest person he had ever met. And hmm. I think a lot of people felt the same way about her. That's interesting. It, this is a, an aside, and many people in our audience may not know about it, but I just wanted to ask you if you had ever met Sylvia Beach Whitman and the, if, if, and the new Shakespeare and Company. Have you been there? Uh, I haven't. I was uh, in Paris. The last time I was in Paris was about 10 or 11 years ago, and I was looking for Shakespeare and Company, and I foolishly looked for Shakespeare and Company at the original address. And, oh, of no. course, today's Shakespeare and Company is really an homage to that. Uh, original Shakespeare and Company, so I never was able to get to the uh, uh, to the current Shakespeare and Company. But I do want to go. Hopefully, I'll be able to get to Paris over the next year or two. But yes, it is nice to see that uh, the current proprietor is named Sylvia in honor of Sylvia Beach, and uh, I think it's wonderful and the devotion that independent booksellers have to uh, to books and to connecting books to people is is something rare these days and something that needs to be kept alive. Yeah, and it's really true of independent bookstores, and it's nice that she bequeathed um, most of her papers and the photographs of all the authors to Mr. Yeah. Whitman, who just died not too long ago. And now yeah, it's uh, one of the remarkable things, and there's so many pictures of, of Shakespeare and Company, but what was so wonderful about it is that it felt as if you were walking into someone's home. It didn't feel like it was a store. It wasn't, um, it wasn't impersonal at all. There were, again, all these pictures that that uh, authors themselves were sending to, to Sylvia Beach because they wanted to have a little presence in this bookshop. And uh, there was this uh, intimacy uh, in the bookshop that made it uh, a wonderful home away from home for the lost generation. You know, I think of Shakespeare and Company as, uh, uh, as a place where the lost generation uh, could go to find a home. And that reminds me, which I had no idea, and knowing he was a great poet and knowing my respect for him just from his being an author, is Ezra Pound like was like a really cool guy. He was, he had, Ezra Pound had a lot of sides to him, and we, one of the sides that comes out uh, in The Most Dangerous Book is his willingness to really do everything he could for writers he believed in. And for Joyce was one of the few writers he really believed in, and he was willing to do anything to help Joyce out. The same was true for, uh, for T.S. Eliot. The same was true for he started the, the careers of uh, several poets 
you know, uh, H.D. Is, is one of them. Marianne Moore, he helped out. And Hemingway. And Hemingway. And uh, Ezra Pound, I sort of think of as this, uh, as this evangelist for these, for these uh, bright young writers, and he had such a great eye for talent. And he was so selfless about it. That's what uh, Hemingway said when he talked about Ezra Pound, that he was, um, he was righteous and angry like a saint, and he, would will, he was willing to do anything for you if, if, he, um, if he saw some talent in you. And, and Hemingway was one of the people who, who benefited from that. One of the great things you talk about is how Hemingway taught him how to box. I can just picture that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I mean, he was, he was uh, they were both game. And uh, one of the things that Hemingway, now if Hemingway finds this remark about, about you, that it must be really true. Hemingway, uh, when he wrote about Ezra Pound, remarked on his intense energy, all this energy that Ezra Pound had. And, I mean, Hemingway himself is someone with a lot of energy. But uh, but for Ezra Pound, especially in those Paris years, it was uh, this constant uh, sense, this conviction that that things needed to be done. That you were on the cusp of of greatness. And uh, again, it's that there's some there's a certain charge in the air uh, in Paris at this time uh, that was really inspiring so many people. It's a funny idea when Hemingway says. Uh, if you could, just, if he would just eat slower, <laughs> <laughs> right? I know. Even even the way he eats, you can tell the the energy is like a volcano. <laughs> <laughs> and the other funny thing is, when you look at him in pictures, like everybody else, kind of looks dated. If you look at Sylvia Beach or if you look at even Joyce, but Ezra Pound looks like he could just hang around with us now. You know, he's got this wild look, but he looks like some kid in college. Just just you know, he he does right because he had this like this Van Dyke facial hair with a mustache and a very uh, thin pointed beard. He looks. He doesn't look dated because he was out of date even at the time. So now, you know, you could see him walking down the streets uh, because, in a way, he's a little bit like a, uh, a hipster. I don't mean to insult uh, Ezra Pound, but there's a, there's yeah. a certain style that he had. Well, his hair, too, his hair too. His hair is like definitely off right, the right. This sort of unkempt hair, and he sort of uh, had the shirts unbuttoned. Um, <laughs> he had uh, trousers that were made uh, from the felt of uh, a billiard table. Uh, so he was eccentric, and he was willing to be eccentric. And it was a time when uh, uh, you didn't, you weren't self-conscious about being eccentric. If uh, he was, you know, in London, London was a very, you know, somewhat stifling atmosphere for someone like Ezra Pound, which is why he ended up going to Paris. Um, but uh, it, it almost seemed as if a city like London, which had somewhat staid sensibilities, couldn't contain him. Yes. I can understand that. And it goes, I, I just can't keep from thinking about how, if not or but for, none of, it's like when uh, Max Brod promised Kafka that he would burn all of his works. And then Max Brod broke the promise. And therefore we have the trial, we have the yeah. castle. And, and you think, well, should he have broken the promise or not? But, but if he kept it, we wouldn't have any of those things. Mm-hmm. And, and I wonder how many famous, wonderful authors never got the opportunity that um, Joyce got. Yeah, you know, it's, I think one of the things that the most dangerous book brings out is that we normally think of a book as a solitary thing, that it's a writer who sits down with pen and paper or these days with a computer and writes something, and then at the end there's a book. But the truth, though, is that it takes a, a large group of people to publish a book. And for Ulysses in particular, it, it's uh, a really an incredible constellation of characters, uh, of, of people for without whom Ulysses wouldn't exist. And in a lot of cases, it's a bizarre uh, mix of people that you wouldn't expect to go together. We have the anarchists uh, and suffragettes who are teaming up with Wall Street lawyers. And you have ACLU lawyers who are teaming up with uh, go-getter publishers who realize that an obscenity case can be uh, great publicity. And uh, so, you know, the, it's, it starts with Joyce, but it radiates out uh, far beyond him. And I sort of think of The Most Dangerous Book as, as a sort of snapshot of the way culture was like in the uh, early 20th century and how literary modernism worked uh, through the, the publication history of one specific book. Yeah, you don't usually think of smuggling as part of the publication process in, uh, right. in a new Stephen King book. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it, it is, you know, it's, and the, the other thing about the book, and you do bring this out, is that 
whether it's Wolseley or whether it's me, um, you know, when you start the book, it's, you know, stately plump mulligan, stately plump buck mulligan descend it or ascend it the staircase and it's, he's carrying this and you think, oh, this is like a regular book. Right. You know, it's like, this is just going to be a book. And, and you think of a book and you talk about this really nicely about, okay, here's a book, here's a story, there's a beginning, there's a middle and an end. There's these characters that will be developed. There's punctuation. There's quotation marks. And, and I think that goes a lot to why, um, well, obviously why it was difficult for anyone to read the book all the way through. And, and that's why it's such a, uh, I guess, a, a monument to the judge that he was able to do so. Yeah, it was... Uh, judge Woolsey spent uh, about two months, I think a little bit over two months, actually reading the book, and this was his vacation. He uh, was lucky enough, another sort of coincidence of history or uh, a nice turn of fate for Joyce is that uh, the reason, part of the reason why the judge was able to read Ulysses in the first place is because he had an extended vacation, and the reason why he had this extended vacation is because he had presided over what was oh, yeah. then the longest trial in U.S. history. So uh, the, 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 the court system gave him this long vacation, and he spent it uh, reading it. But it's true. He was, you know, he was no more used to seeing uh, a book like this than anyone else was at the time. And one of the things that's startling about Ulysses is that you turn the page to the next chapter, and the next chapter is entirely different. And as soon as you start to get used to the way one chapter is written, you uh, turn to another chapter, and that's all changed. And this is part of what made Ulysses so unsettling to people. And it's hard to think of it now because we're used to people changing styles. But uh, at the time, you know, when T.S. Eliot read it, he, he said, wow, this is destroying all of the styles. All of the styles of the English language are destroyed. He had reduced them all to futility. And the 19th century has been destroyed, which for T.S. Eliot was wonderful. Um, but it was, it, it was a, you read Ulysses and you can see Joyce really did absorb all these different styles. There's one chapter where he effectively starts with Middle English and goes through the development of the English language up until the present day. And they all get uh, uh, transformed in this, this new language, and Joyce called it uh, scorching all the styles uh, of the English language, and that's uh, that was one of the things that, that people found really disturbing, that it seemed as if tradition itself was being destroyed by Ulysses. It wasn't just the sexuality of the book, which, which of course, was also disturbing, but it was uh, the way in which the tradition of English letters uh, seemed to be uh, cast overboard. This next question will lead me into a whole other area, which is great because I had these questions written down, but you just led into the area which <clears throat> Virginia Woolf's elitist view of the book and then her essentially conversion that turned into one of her best literary accomplishments. Maybe you can tell that story. Yeah, so Virginia Woolf first uh, came in touch with Ulysses when it was being serialized in the Little Review, uh, which was published in New York, and uh, so it wasn't yet finished, and she didn't really like it. And it, you know, kept being serialized, and at some point, uh, Harriet Shaw Weaver asked Virginia Woolf if she would print uh, portions of Ulysses for her magazine, The Egoist, because they couldn't find a printer. Uh, the laws at the time stipulated that not only were booksellers and publishers liable for obscenity, but so were printers. So. Uh, whoever printed the book could uh, potentially go to jail for printing something if it were deemed obscene. She uh, effectively rejected Ulysses. She said that she didn't want to print it. And the ostensible reason, the reason that she gave Harriet Weaver was that uh, they were too busy, they didn't have enough time. But the truth is that uh, she didn't like Ulysses very much. And Leonard Wolfe, her husband, was worried that they would get prosecuted. Uh, he asked a few people uh, what they thought about the book. and. And they told him that he would be legally liable for any charges. So uh, that ended that portion of, of Ulysses for her. And uh, after 1922, or you know, in 1921 and 1922, she befriends uh, T.S. Eliot, and uh, T.S. Eliot was raving about Ulysses. And every time he'd come over to dinner, he'd keep talking about Ulysses over and over again. This is a wonderful book. You have to read it. It's it's incredible. It's almost impossible to write novels anymore after this book. Um, and finally, 
you know, because she respected C.S. Eliot, she said, okay, I'm, I'm going to read it from cover to cover now. And she bought a copy of the book and read it, and she still didn't really like it. She thought that parts of it were good. She thought that it was a little bit of um, a misfire, as she put it, that there were a lot of uh, little, you know, you're getting little tiny pebbles hitting your face instead of one shotgun blast. Right, as she described it in her, in her diary. But there was something about Ulysses that worked really slowly on the minds of people. And this happened for Virginia Woolf as well, where she didn't like it, uh, but she ended up thinking about it. And as the weeks and months went by, she thought about it more and more. And she started to get inspired by the idea, by the uh, largeness of the idea, and by the fact that it was a book that didn't have to deal with only beautiful things, that it dealt with unpleasant things, and that it was so close to the characters that it described. So eventually, Virginia Woolf ended up writing Mrs. Dalloway, which is, to some degree, her version of Ulysses. It's uh, told in one day in London instead of Dublin, and it follows the consciousnesses of uh, three separate characters. And at the time, it was her most ambitious book, and it owes uh, quite a bit to her reading of James Joyce. It's it's so fascinating when you're dealing with Mrs. Dalloway and Ulysses because as a reader, it's very difficult to understand and to read while you realize that you're examining an entire life, inside and outside. And so like right now, as I'm thinking, well, how much time do I have left to talk here? Um, and, and you're maybe thinking, well, what's my next interview or whatever? Mm -hmm. The most poignant moment in the book for me was <laughs> during the arguments when um, uh, when I guess Ernst says you know right now I'm thinking <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of how your robe doesn't fit well right. and this and then and then you know he, you know he knows he's got him then because right. what he said <laughs> and I'm looking back at the chair and thinking hmm I wonder if I wonder <laughs> and you realize this is what people do all the time they never right. stop doing it and yeah, that's, I mean, I've, I, that, is the, that was the real insight uh, at the trial, and it was what Woolsey ended up talking about in his decision. We think of consciousness as a stream, and this metaphor comes from uh, William James, and I think it's useful, but it's also misleading because it's not exactly like a stream. That sort of suggests this singular flow of a, you know, uh, of a set of words that can, that can be strung one after the other on a page. For Joyce and for Judge Woolsey and for uh, more concerns of the trial, it was really more uh, like uh, multiple images or ideas overlaying one another so that we have one particular thing that's the focus of our attention. But whenever we're focusing, we're always also thinking about other things. And what part of why Ulysses can be difficult at times is because it pays attention to the fact that there are multiple things happening in our mind at once. Even when we're thinking over a specific problem or when we're remembering something or when we're uh, at work at something in our day-to-day -day lives, we are inundated with these tiny things in our lives, whether it's a sort of a glass on the table or it's a memory that we had from a long time ago or a hope for something to happen tomorrow. And it's this multidimensionality of any given second of our lives that's important and that shows the complexity uh, of who we are as people. You can't read Ulysses without thinking about the way you think. And that's one of the things that I think happened to people when they were reconsidering the book. You know, when Virginia Woolf starts to realize that she can be aware of her own thoughts and they're not exactly the way you think they're going to be. It's not this fluid easy stream. It's a lot more complicated than that. Yeah, it's, it's, you can almost think, I mean, if you're placing an advertisement like Leopold is, and you have all the, I mean, it's not that they're mentally ill people, but you can s almost see it that way. But I know there's times in my own life, many times, where I'm doing something very plebeian, very something work a day, and yet the thing I'm thinking about behind that is much more important, whether you're mm -hmm. thinking of a, a memory uh, that gives rise to regret or guilt, or whether you're thinking back to a happy Christmas morning, 
Mm-hmm. Your your mind does that to you, and the only way you can avoid that is if you live in the moment, um, and that's yeah. so hard to do. I mean, it's you know, I think our minds are not particularly good at uh, giving proportional time and attention to the things that are proportionally important. Uh, you'd think that we would think most about the things that are most important and least about the things that aren't. But for some reason, our minds don't really work that way. And uh, Joyce was an artist. You know, one of the ways we think of Joyce and what makes him distinctive as an artist is that we think of him as an artist of epiphanies, right? And what what defines the Joyce in epiphany is that it can come from something very small. It can come from looking up at a cloud and seeing, you know, Stephen and uh, Leopold actually see the same cloud uh, in the morning in Dublin. They're in different parts of the city, but it, it's a little tiny thing that connects them. Uh, or, you know, the way a bracelet falls on someone's wrist or the way someone uh, tears apart uh, a pastry. These little tiny things in life, things that we normally overlook, can end up having an outsized effect, and we can sort of have large insights into things uh, from them. And that's that's what it means to talk about a Joycean epiphany, and it's part of what uh, distinguishes Joyce's writing from the writing of so many others. Yeah, when I had my seminar in college, we talked about the idea of a gnomon, the idea of a part of something being this tiny part of a greater whole. And I remember when I was 18 years old in college, I remember I, it was in Florida, and um, I found a chameleon on a tree, and I picked it up, and it opened its mouth, and a spider came out. <laughs> and so I was 18, and all these years later, yeah, that res- why I mean it didn't mean anything, but it yeah. meant everything. It's it's such a and that image in particular is such a, a vivid image. Uh, I can easily understand how you would never forget that, right? But think of the sometimes some of the things that you you know remember are silly things like uh, you know pointless things. Um, why do I remember them? I, d- I have no idea, you know, why I do, but they they stick with us. And, you know, for for Joyce, he wanted to tell the the history of this city and the history of the lives of these people uh, through the story of one day. And it's true that this idea of uh, the part containing the whole is is what's behind uh, what's behind Ulysses. That if you could really tell everything about just one day, say everything about it you would know about so much more than that one day. Yeah, when uh, I graduated law school, my mother gave me a pocket watch, and I asked her to inscribe it with an omnibus partibus reluca totem, which yeah. means in each, par- in each particle, the whole repeats itself. Yeah. And if you ever really think about it like you just articulated, uh, and you actually believe it, it does change your entire view of the universe. Yeah, it's sort of like a, I mean, I describe it in my book as sort of uh, like a fractal of right. Western civilization where, like, you know, you can see uh, the, the, the part is just a small version of the whole. And that's what you know, the whole project of Ulysses is basically saying, look, what, what can happen on this one day is not fundamentally different from this od- uh, the Odyssey, right? This epic that took place, uh, or didn't really take place, but this epic written thousands of years ago. And to see our own normal, maybe boring lives as versions of these heroic lives was fascinating to Joyce, and it's something that he wanted to experiment with. So for Joyce, history wasn't uh, linear, it wasn't a line going forward, it was uh, cyclical, and, and we're part of this cycle. And you know, our great-grandchildren will repeat our stories, and we're repeating the stories of our great-grandparents. Yes, it's... Um it's funny too, and and you don't have you do have some time to get into Finnegan's Wake a little bit in your book, just because, and we can talk about Joyce's physical pain too, but the thing about it is is that you have this one book that's about a day in the life of essentially three people, um, and then you have Finnegan's Wake, which breaks through other barriers, which is that there really isn't it isn't really a novel of any kind. And it's yeah. it's a history, not a history. It's a, a retelling of dreams, but mm-hmm. all the dreams, and and that's why with my my little daughter, we used to sit up at night and read Finnegan's Wake, because as, <laughs> as, she was wow, like five. Wow, you must have some daughter. That's incredible. No, but think about it. Is it really? Because she could read it fine, 
but it doesn't make any difference because she couldn't understand oh, it yeah. and I couldn't understand it. I think the only thing you can do with Finnegan's Wake is to open it any page, yeah. read it aloud with an Irish accent. Yeah, right. You know, I think that's true. The, the, you know, your daughter or children in general, I think, are more tuned to the musicality of language yes. than we are. And they're more comfortable with not knowing the meanings of words than we are. And that's, I sometimes wonder if people would be less uh, upset with Finnegan's Wake if we stopped calling it a novel and we thought of it as a prose poem or something like that, where you know, the expectations of a novel are just not there. They're not fulfilled by a book like Finnegan's Wake. But I also tell people, look, if you've... So many people say to me, uh, you know, Kevin, I've, I've never read Ulysses, uh, but after reading your book, I'm thinking of giving it a try. Huh. Uh, that's one of the best compliments I think I can get. But uh, they're still nervous about actually doing it. And I'll say, well, look, read the first 10 pages of Finnegan's <laughs> Wake, and then go back to Ulysses, and you'll find that Ulysses is, is much easier. So if you want Ulysses to seem easy by comparison, Finnegan's Wake is, is, uh, is your book. Well, you also kind of tricked them too, because you got to get out of the Martello Tower. I mean, yeah, that's true. I also, I, I do warn them that the third episode is the most difficult one, and I think that's where most people stop. They don't, they figure that the book is going to get progressively more difficult, and that's not really what happens uh, at all. There's, it sort of undulates back and forth. But if you can get past the third episode, uh, you're in really good shape. And one of the things you say is kind of comforting to people is. You know, you don't really have to understand it while you're reading it, you know? You don't have to. Yeah, and I think that's what happens. There's an episode, an episode called uh, Sirens, and mm-hmm. it begins with this overture. And I actually ha- heard a reading of it uh, yesterday for Bloomsday. Someone did a reading of that, uh, of the overture for Sirens. And it doesn't really make any sense. It's sort of a dry run, I think, for, for Finnegan's Wake. Um, it doesn't make sense when you initially reading it, but it does make sense in retrospect, because what happens is that it's basically a, a whole range of sounds that ended up that end up getting inserted into different parts of the book, and suddenly you realize, oh, okay, this is the sound of uh, coins in Blaze's Boylan's pocket, or the sound of uh, hooves uh, going down the street because the, the Viceroy is in town and there's a little parade. So, uh, but the, the the episode itself is written in the style of music. That's why it's the Sirens episode, and it's inspired by music. And in order to write a, a, a an episode that is musical, you have to make the sounds of words more important than the meanings of words. And so that's uh, that's one way to do it, is to make the words m- not technically uh, uh, dictionary words. The thing that comes to mind almost every time I start talking about this is how the hell did he do it? You know? It's like, how the hell was he able to do this? It's almost impossible to believe. How did he, how did he write Ulysses? How, yeah, how, how, I mean, when I read Portrait of the Artist, I identified with it. I was at prep school at the time. I didn't like being there. When he writes, <laughs> in, the, when he writes in the inside of his book, James Joyce, Dublin, Ireland, right. the world, whatever, I did that too. And, and, and then reading Dubliners was slightly more difficult, but you could, in fact, you know, they're doing um, Dubliners at 100. Um, the, right. Yeah, do, you've read about that? Yes. That's going to be really cool, except I can't imagine anyone doing the dead, but I guess they're, they're going to find someone to do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so when you read, when you read um, uh, Portrait of the Artist and you read Dubliners, you think, well, yeah, this is really good, and I'm ready to d- dive into this new one he has. And then you just like, it's like someone's cut your legs off. Yeah, it's, uh, it is strange, you know, the magic that goes on in, you know, an artist's uh, mind that turns a small project into a massive project. And Ulysses was initially meant to be a short story in Dubliners. It wasn't supposed to be very long. It was just supposed to be a few pages. But something somehow happens. Uh, and some unforeseeable growth took place in his mind, and it became larger and larger, and he realized, no, this is, this is a novel. Um, but to think of Ulysses as just a, a story in Dubliners is, is uh, such a radically different thing. Uh, but he, you know, the inspiration uh, took hold, and it was uh, hard work. One of the things that, that you know, you ask, you know, how did Joyce end, end up doing it? How did he sort of achieve this? It's partly stubbornness. He was, uh, he had this dogged sense of 
um, uh, of a mission, right? That, that he was sort of uh, meant to do something like this and that it was worthwhile. And I think if you believe that what you're doing is worthwhile the way James Joyce did, uh, you're willing to endure um, you know, all the hardship and travails that go along with, uh, with trying to, uh, to make your endeavors happen. As we're getting ready to wind up, why don't we, this is one thing you need to tell the audience, I think, to understand the entire process, this is, and this is where you go into the biography because you have to, is tell, you know, I guess, the backdrop of, of the pain and suffering that James Joyce went through and the genesis of that pain and suffering with regard to his vision and other physical problems. Yeah. So, well, one of the things that's gotten a lot of uh, attention uh, about the book uh, so far is uh, my discovery of a medication that Joyce uh, was given in 1928. Joyce had very severe uh, eye problems, uh, starting at the very least in 1907 and really lasting through his entire life. He was effectively blind by the time he was finishing uh, Finnegan's Wake. And uh, it's one of the problems is that none of the biographers that uh, you know, there are about eight biographies of Joyce. No one actually explains why he was getting these eye problems. One of the things I discovered is that in 1928, James Joyce was given three weeks of injections of arsenic and phosphorus. And th this medication is actually an anti-syphilitic drug called Galil, uh, G-A-L-Y-L. And uh, effectively, the by far the most common reason why someone would have these eye problems, uh, these, uh, these infections of your irises or swelling of the irises, is because of syphilis. So Joyce had, uh, almost, had symptoms that could almost only be explained by syphilis, and his doctor, a doctor that he'd had for years, was treating him for syphilis. So I think the only reasonable conclusion uh, is that James Joyce had syphilis, and so it was something that he was suffering privately from for, um, for quite a long time, and uh, uh, really affected uh, his life in, in powerful ways. If you, know, if you want to think about um, um, you know, epiphanies and how, how important changes can come from small things, that's one example of it. I, mean, I think what syphilis did was that it intensified what he already felt about life. I mean, imagine having a sharp pain on the inside of your eye. And that pain might go away. It might go away for weeks or months, uh, but it'll suddenly recur uh, out of nowhere. You could be walking down the street, you could be brushing your teeth, grocery shopping, and suddenly the pain will return. And at some point, your doctor is going to tell you that you have to get eye surgery for it, that the only way to reduce the pressure that's building up inside of your eye is to uh, cut away a small piece of your iris. And Joyce had undergone about 12 of these eye surgeries over the course of his life. So this is a part of his day-to-day -day life, the fear of pain, the experience of pain, the anticipation of future pain, and going blind slowly. And ultimately, this is the, being caused by a tiny microscopic spirochete that had invaded uh, his eyes. Uh, so you have the tiniest of things that this tiny unseeable thing is is transforming uh, his life. And I think it's there's something joyous about that. Yeah, it's, um, and I'm definitely running out of time, and I have one more question, but yeah, that one scene you talk about when Miss Weaver first sees him, and I think it's Miss Weaver, and she sees his eye and is dead. Yes. And also when Hemingway writes that letter saying, hey, my daughter just nicked my eye, I just have an idea of what you must be going through. And yeah, this uh, like really incredible pain. It's it's hard to imagine it. I sort of had to force myself to imagine it. And some people think, oh, this this is I can't believe you're writing about this. But the truth is that you know, Joyce is an artist of day to day experience, and we can't fully understand Joyce's life unless we're willing to look at what his his actual experience was like. And when when Sylvia Beach first saw James Joyce, he didn't have a pupil. There was no pupil in his eye, and the reason why is because the uh, the inflammation in his iris had produced uh, this sort of uh, uh, pus was sort of developing inside of his eye, and sort of uh, blood and biotic material gets floating around 
uh, it ends up congealing, and when it congeals, it will actually cover the pupil, so the, the space where the light is supposed to, to shine through and get to your retina, uh, it actually can't penetrate anymore, and you don't have a pupil anymore. It's just this, this uh, grayish uh, haze of... Uh, yeah. of an eye. You and describe that's, it. You know. <laughs> that's describe what he looked like. And that's some of, uh, you know, you've seen, everyone is, is familiar with pictures of Joyce wearing an eye patch. Uh, he was often wearing those eye patches because he was recovering from surgery, but every now and then he was wearing an eye patch because he had a nebula covering his pupil. And you make it sound really yucky, too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the truth is that it's not pretty. There's no... There's no polite and easy way to talk about uh, serious eye problems and, and eye surgeries. It's just, <laughs> it's just difficult no matter what. Okay, let me ask you this one last question. Then next time you come, it will be after you've written your book about Finnegan's Wake, which you'll be like, you'll be like. <laughs> I hope you'll help me with that. That's I'm not sure I'm prepared. To <laughs> you'll be like, do that. you'll be like 20 years older. <laughs> well, maybe your daughter can help. Me. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell her you said so. Um, so the last question was, uh, I love. Obviously, you know, I have an independent bookstore, so. Even though I can say a thousand times you can't judge a book by its cover, but everyone does. And your cover is, you know, reminiscent of another cover. So talk about that within the next 30 seconds or so. Yeah, so the cover of The Most Dangerous Book is an homage to the first legal edition of Ulysses that was published by Random House in 1934. And it's a beautiful book. It was designed by Ernst Reichel, and he designed both the outside and the inside, so that it would be, in a way, in itself, a work of art, this modernist uh, work of art. And the typography is beautiful. The first uh, letter of the book, that's S for stately plump buck mulligan, has a page all to itself, a massive S. And uh, the, the, the object of uh, Ulysses, Ulysses as just a physical book, was such an important thing to people who were reading it. and. Uh, I'm really happy that uh, the Penguin Press was able to sort of invoke this, this physical presence for the book because uh, because it's so important. Yeah, I think it really makes a difference in terms of people wanting to, and especially aficionados, seeing this and going, oh, I have to have this book. Yeah. Well, in any case, I'm definitely out of time. They're going to kill me. But um, I, w I could get, we, obviously, it's like we were t you were talking about reading groups. We could definitely go on and on forever about this. Right. But, Thank you uh, so much, Kevin, for being here. Um, it, it was really enjoyable talking to you, and it's a great book. And um, Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Kevin Birmingham discussing in the most dangerous book, which is about Ulysses, and uh, it is one of my favorite books. I took a seminar, be vain enough to say an honors seminar in college on it, and um, it just changed my life. And then the book changed my life, and um, Portrait of the Artist, and... Um, and Dubliners, and I can honestly say that I have no idea what Finnegan's Wake means. I like reading it, but um, I read it at night by myself, aloud, like I said, in an Irish accent. I think that's the only way you can get through any of it. Um, it's a very musical book. But after you read this book, I think, you know, as Kevin said, I think you can give um, Ulysses a try. Just keep with it. It's well worth the effort. <clears throat> in any event, uh, next week we're searching for, well, we're not searching, we got tons of them. The question is, who are we going to get to interview? And uh, unfortunately, for one of the few times, I don't actually know who it's going to be. But you can be assured that it will be somebody interesting and somebody who's written a novel that um, will, uh, you know, affect you and me. Um, I try to search for those that I like, which I hope are the same ones that you might like as well. So thanks, as always, for joining us here on The Avid Reader. We will talk to you next week. You've been listening to The Avid Reader Show with your host, Sam Hankin. Sam will be back next week with reviews and interviews of some of the more interesting books and authors of today.